Hello and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Junglist. And I'm Bajo. This week we'll be putting on our thinking caps and frying a few brain cells with Professor Layton in the Curious Village. It's a murder mystery with a puzzling outcome for the Nintendo DS. Gran Turismo is one of the big game racing franchises. Number five is due out next year, but in the meantime, Rev Heads can get a taste of what is to come with Prologue. But is it worth taking for a spin? Sins of a Solar Empire is independently produced and released and brings turn-based space strategy into real time. But does it send us into hyperdrive? And we look at one gamer's battle with serious illness and how gaming helped him through. But first, can you guess the game for this week? Puzzling, eh? <laughs> Off you go. Good game. Blizzard, producers of World of Warcraft, are suing Michael Donnelly, who is responsible for making the bot MMO Glider, which performs tasks in the game like fighting or fishing automatically. Blizzard argues that the bot consumes far more resources than a real-life player and infringes the end-user license agreement. They have requested Mr. Donnelly stop selling his product and return all profits from its sale to them. Mr. Donnelly has sold over 100,000 copies of his software, but says his tool does not infringe copyright because no copy of the game client is made. The two parties are now awaiting a judgment from an Arizona court. The Standing Committee of Attorneys General have decided to consult with the Australian public before making their decision on the introduction of an R18 plus classification for video games. The current system, which only allows a maximum of an MA15 plus and has seen the controversial refusal of many games in the past, is set to be reviewed by the committee later this year. But before any decisions are made, the community will be consulted on the issue. Victorian Deputy Premier and Attorney General Rob Hulls has welcomed the decision, saying he considers it inconsistent that Australian adults can view adults-only films, but not computer games with the same level of content. After months of speculation that game publisher Atari was facing severe financial difficulties, the company has been delisted from the NASDAQ stock exchange. The NASDAQ Qualifications Department determined that Atari no longer met the requirements of a listed company, due to the fact that the total market value of their publicly held shares has dropped below 15 million US dollars. In response, Atari have requested an appeal, although a determination in their favor is uncertain. Good game! Two months ago, Baron Augustus Reinhold passed away. Shortly after his death, his will was disclosed. The contents of it were fascinating, to say the least. The Reinhold family treasure, the golden apple, is hidden somewhere within this village. To whomever successfully locates this treasure, I offer the whole of my estate. And so begins Professor Layton and the Curious Village. You play as the professor who arrives in the village of St. Mysterie with his young sidekick Luke, only to find that the villagers are up to no good. There's missing people, dead bodies, a wild beast on the loose, and a hysterical madam of the manor who, on top of all that, has lost her cat. It's up to you to solve these, plus a lot more mysteries, and the way you do that is by solving puzzles. And there's a lot of them, 135 to be exact, plus a new one to download each week. As you move through the story, you'll meet and talk with the villagers, all of whom are obsessed with puzzles and will only release information if you solve them. And here's where the game gets clever. The puzzles are great, ranging from tricky mathematical problems. That should do it. to solving mazes, rearranging shapes in a minimum number of moves, to tricky word plays. When you solve a puzzle as well as progressing through the story, you get picker rats and sometimes a bit of a missing picture or mechanical dog. And these are all mini puzzles in themselves. Harder puzzles award more picker rats and there's also a hint system where you can get a hint by spending one gold coin. The first hint is usually pretty useless. Yeah, it's kind of like a rehash of the problem, isn't it? Yeah, but coins are easy to come by so there's easy help if you need and you're not penalized for skipping a puzzle either. In fact, they make it pretty easy to come back to them by keeping all the skipped puzzles in one room. 
They've done a lot to make this game very playable. Every time you restart it, you get a what's happened so far sequence, which is kind of like a previously on blah, blah, blah in a TV show. It'd be good if more games could adopt this. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I agree. And I also thought the developers made great use of the touch screen. You know, you can write notes on it while you're doing a puzzle and you can erase it. This means you can have a go without really having to submit your answer. My one major criticism, though, would be the story. I mean, it's hardly a page, or in this case, a screen turner, and there seems to be an epidemic of text at the moment. There's just far too much. Writers, show some restraint. Tell the story and let us get on with the game. Far too often, we're just tap-tap-tapping through pages of pointless drivel. Ugh. Yeah, it definitely suffers from JDS, this one. JDS? Japanese Dialogue Syndrome. Mm -hmm. And you know, the game has a lot more in common with a game than homework, but parents, this is one game you're not gonna mind your kids wanting to play more of, and you'll enjoy it too. Luke, here's my answer. Score jump? I'm a bit of a fanatic when it comes to logic problems, and it's rare to find this many quality brain teasers in one package. Excellent use of DS functionality, but the main strength here is its content, and with a game like this, that's what matters. So, Badge, if I have 27 feathers total, and each of my chickens had 10 feathers but lost 7, how many chickens do I have? And that's my rating. Nine. Well, you know, I found myself after a couple of hours kind of enjoying these problems that I used to groan about in school. It reminded me a little bit of brain training, but a bit more variety. I'm giving it seven and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. Good game. For some people, gaming can be more than just a hobby. Ryan Bird from Victoria is one such gamer. Here's his story. At the age of um, 16, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, and pretty much was uh, told that I probably wouldn't see my 18th birthday. They gave me like about a 30% chance of seeing my 18th birthday. Well, I was pretty much going into hospital for treatment pretty much every day of the week. I had 14 to 18 months of chemo and radiotherapy and then a bone marrow transplant at the end of that. I was on a lot of drugs at the time, a lot of painkillers. With all the chemicals and stuff they were putting through my body, I was pretty tired most of the time. I was probably only really conscious or awake for maybe six hours a day at the most. At the time when I was diagnosed, um, I, I've always been heavily into games, but um, the new thing out was the, the, that was when the Nintendo GameCube came out. Um, so a lot of my friends kind of knew that I loved games and stuff like that, so they got together and fundraised at the school and, um, to get me one. I'd take it in with me and while I was having chemo or something like that, I'd be able to sit there and play it. When I was having my bone marrow transplant, I was pretty much locked in a room for a, a month and a half. Um, so not being able to get out of there, um, I'd sit there and pretty much play that whenever I could um, to kind of, I suppose, in a way, help me get out of there. Got pretty damn good at Tony Hawk. Um, I remember lots of Zelda. Um, Mario Sunshine when it came out. As well as games, I also played a lot of sports when I was younger. Um, but having chemo and radiotherapy really knocks you around. Um, and so games beca became the kind of thing that um, were the only feeling of, I suppose, com competition that I could get and a feeling of achievement. Um, it's different to movies and stuff like that where you, you purely sit down and watch a movie and you can get enjoyment out of that, but you can't get that feeling of achievement that you could get from a game um, that makes you feel better about yourself. And so you'll pick up a game and you'll play it for an hour and you'll forget that you've got this immense pain in, in, well, in my chest I had it. So you'll forget that this terrible thing is happening to you and you eventually after an hour or so you'll feel a bit tired so you put the controller down and you'll start to go, oh yeah, my chest hurts. I'm in remission now, um, have been for about a year or two, I suppose. Um, but yeah, still playing a lot of games. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about games and who games are specifically for and stuff like that, um, which gives them a lot of bad press. But there's also not much understanding about actually what games can do um, mentally for someone and, and how they can help them through um, times when they might be feeling down. A lot of people get depression and that kind of thing and they get really down on 
life. And I think that if I hadn't have had games to get me through uh, the treatment that I was going through, um, I probably would have gone crazy. Gran Turismo 5 isn't due out until next year, but to tantalise rev heads and car enthusiasts alike, Polyphony Digital have released Gran Turismo 5 Prologue on PS3. Now, we're not afraid to admit that we're car noobs, and if Bejo's choice of a tuned Suzuki Swift as a supercar isn't enough of an example... My car's yellow, Jung. We don't really know what's considered fast or good. Having said that, we do like to think we know what makes a good racing game. Prologue has six tracks plus alternates and 71 cars to choose from. If you've never played a GT before, you might find yourself being a little put off by the simple track design and the lack of damage to the cars. However, you'll soon be itching to beat those times, find the best overtake spots and figure out which gear goes with which corner. Now, I know braking and automatic oversteer control don't really sit well with you, Batch. Yeah, Jung, I wasn't really enjoying myself at first, but then I turned off all the auto steer options and turned my car traction right down, and I was sliding around to my heart's content. There's plenty of options to race the way you want, from changing your transmission and your tyres, to turning a driving line on or off. GT is definitely a Sunday afternoon style racing game and according to their website this is the first one where you can actually race online. Online racing is very playable but you do get a bit of car wobble which happens sometimes when racing games don't have dedicated servers. By racing online you can actually earn credits which let you buy other cars and this is great. There's also a penalty system which means if you hit a barrier or if you go across a piece of grass you can actually get restricted engine power for a period of time. Also, if you act unpredictably online, your car will go transparent so you don't interfere with the other drivers. It's there to stop online griefing, but we found it a little noobified. Yeah, John, you know, I, I like blocking other drivers and, and acting unpredictably. I mean, isn't that what part of racing is about? It's kind of forcing you to play a certain way, and there's already been a patch to Prologue, so hopefully there'll be another one which can make this a setting on or off. Thankfully, this transparent car effect doesn't make it into two-player split-screen, which is great fun. Although, it would have been nice to face off against some AI opponents at the same time. From what I can gather, Gran Turismo Artificial Intelligence has always been a bit of a matchbox car procession where you appear to be the mayor from Crazy Town who just happened to get a ticket to the event. However, in Prologue, you see other cars taking risks here and there and not always pulling it off. It's still quite evident, though, that you're taking the race far less seriously than everyone else. But we've not yet discussed what GT is all about, the cars. There's lots of choice and they look fantastic. And whereas in GT4, where you'd usually have about 4,000 polygons per car, in Prologue it's upwards of 200,000 and you can really see the difference. Reflections look great, they move well, and there's only a minor bit of slowdown on the dustier tracks. Even if you're not a car buff, you can definitely see the detail that's gone into making these cars look as close to the real thing as possible. They also handle very differently, especially once you start playing with the driving options. When you complete all three classes, you unlock a quick tune feature. This allows you to tune everything from springs to tyres to engine power, and you can actually adjust this on the fly during a race. We haven't tried this yet because, honestly, Class A is really hard. If you don't know much about cars, or if you're not prepared to write down all the stats and compare them, you might end up spending all your hard-earned credits on a random car, and that can get frustrating fast. Yeah, the in-game help gives you lots of information on how to drive, but it would have been nice to have some sort of car comparison showing the strengths and weaknesses of each car, or a test drive option. I don't like grinding for cash for something if I don't know what I'm going to get, and I found when I hit the difficulty wall here, I just put the game away. Final thoughts? Even though it's really just a big demo, Prologue holds as a game on its own. And some elements of it are a bit dated compared to other races out there, but GT fans will definitely enjoy the cartooning and the detail. I'm giving it 8.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Badge? Gran Turismo definitely is about the cars and the way they race, and, and that's where the realism is. But for me, the realism in a game comes from car damage and, and interesting environments and crowds that react to you and fences you can knock over. So I struggled a little bit in seeing the appeal here. But i got to say, I did want to beat those times. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10 rubber chickens.
Racing games are fast. They're an intense bumper-to-bumper -bumper battle to be the first past the finish line. In the studio tonight is Mike Ottoman. He's the fastest thing on four wheels. Doesn't matter how many wheels I have, I'll always win. <laughs> what are you supposed to be, some kind of walking billboard? When you're this good, you're bound to have more than one sponsor. Really? So what does it take to be successful at these games? Timing, precision, accuracy, and speed. So do things ever get tricky out on the track? Are you kidding me? Try driving at breakneck speeds with other opponents trying to turn your car into a smoking wreck with a barrage of turtles and bananas. Banana turtle? What? Richard, it gets serious out there. One hit and you're gone. Your car will be like... Okay, so what? Oh my god, we're on fire! Okay... Well, do these skills actually transfer into your real-life driving? Well, they would! What do you mean, would? Well, I might have had my license suspended. For what? Reckless driving, assault with a deadly weapon, and suspected animal abuse. Animal abuse? Yeah. Well, those shells have to come from somewhere. <laughs> If you enjoy matching colored gems or lining up abstract shapes, the odds are you like puzzle games. And you're not alone. Puzzle games are among the most enduring and popular of all gaming genres. And it also happens to be one of those special game types that can appeal to almost anyone, even if you don't play games. The puzzle story starts way back in 1978, with Nintendo's first ever arcade game titled Computer Othello. It was an electronic version of the puzzling board game Reversi, and is commonly regarded as the first real puzzle game. A few years later, and another important early puzzle game hit the scene. Qbert's Cubes by Gottlieb saw you controlling this long-snooted character in one of the first color-matching games. But it wasn't until the mid-80s that puzzle games would really leave their mark on the world, and it was a little shape-matching game from Russia that would do it. Of course, the game was Tetris, Designed and programmed by Alexei Pajitnov, Tetris was based around a very simple idea. Shapes fell from the sky, and you had to arrange them to complete lines across the screen, racking up massive points while you were at it. The first worldwide release of Tetris came in 1986 on the PC, and although Tetris fever was slow to start, it soon became an international phenomenon. In 1989, Nintendo purchased the rights to Tetris, and both the NES and Game Boy versions of the game were released in that same year. They both became instant hits, with the Game Boy version alone selling over 33 million copies, making it one of the highest selling games of all time. After Tetris, puzzle games were everywhere. Game publisher California Dreams narrowly avoided copyright infringement when they transported Tetris into the third dimension with their game Blockout, while Taito released two influential puzzle games, Plotting and Puznik, both which required you to shift tiles to match two of a kind. It also didn't take long for Nintendo's main rival, Sega, to come up with their own answer to Tetris, with Columns released for the Sega Mega Drive in 1990. Columns was similar to Tetris, but instead of shapes falling from the sky, it was gems. When you matched three or more jewels of the same color, it would clear them off the screen and earn you those all-important puzzle points. Columns became a hit in its own right, and like Tetris, it would go on to inspire plenty of imitators, with games like Dr. Mario, Poyo Poyo, and Super Puzzle Fighter, all containing elements of Columns' simple design. In 1994, the puzzle genre took an interesting new turn with Taito's Puzzle Bobble. Instead of arranging or swapping different colored gems, you had to shoot them at each other with a gem-loaded cannon. Puzzle Bobble would prove popular enough to spawn several sequels, and it would also inspire the creation of other games like Puzz Loop, or more recently, Zuma. The majority of today's most popular puzzle games are still using the same color and shape matching formulas of the past. Bejeweled and Puzzle Quest are clearly descended from games like Puznik. Luminous takes some of its design from Columns, while Alexei Pajitnov's Tetris is still being reworked and released for every gaming platform imaginable. There are, however, some games that defy the puzzle genre's blocky conventions and deliver something truly unique. Take this for example. 
It's Crush on the PSP, and it's one of the best new puzzle ideas to appear in years. Instead of manipulating blocks and gems, you had to manipulate the fabric of reality to squash your world from three dimensions to two in a quest to collect your lost marbles. And then, of course, there's Valve Software's Portal. Need we say more? So whatever your puzzling preference is, puzzle games are guaranteed to keep us all scratching our heads far into the future. Underling, why are you so nervous? My female, she come today. Ah, the one you met with Smoke Signal. Why are you nervous to meet her? I have not seen her face to face. I worry she ugly. Hmm, it is true. Sometimes when meeting mate with Smoke Signal, you not get what you expect. <laughs> there, in distance, she come. Oh, she, oh, 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 oh. You in luck, underling. She beautiful. I happy. Good game. Plucked from the vast untamed beast that is the interwebs comes an independently developed game that aims to bring all the elements of turn-based space strategy games, like hyperspace jumping, universe exploration, and empire building, into real time. Sins of a Solar Empire achieves this and then some. But the question is, is it a good game? Even though it's indie, the interface is better than most AAA titles, comparable to Supreme Commander. In fact, it has the same zoom in, zoom out function. Action is based on a two-dimensional plane with a 3D camera, which lets you play the angle that you want to play at. And there's a nifty feature that knows when you're zooming in on a certain ship, so the camera will follow that ship until you do something else. Planets have a gravity well around them where you build orbital structures and where your ships hang out. Ships move throughout the map by hyper jumping from gravity well to gravity well, and no actual fighting is done in open space. Phase jump complete. The way you set up your base doesn't have as much of an effect on the game as other RTSs, but there are limited upgrade slots on both planets and ships, forcing you to think about your overall strategy beforehand. Also, the positioning of your ships in battle only has a minimal effect, meaning you only have to do basic micro so you can focus on the grand strategy. The game's three factions are very similar to Supreme Commanders, and they all have similar units. However, they get certain technologies at different stages of the tech tree, causing a vast difference in playstyle. And it makes the tech tree easier to understand as well. Now, when you start the game, the tutorial is good, but it doesn't explain everything, and the lack of a single-player campaign with a steady difficulty curve kind of throws you in the deep end. It won't take you long to turn the music off, and in skirmishes you can choose between pre-made maps, custom maps, or randomly generated maps. The AI is decent enough, but you will want to take this one online. Talking of online, we experience pings of about a thousand, and that's huge, and it makes dropouts a real threat. Also, the online population only fluctuated from about 60 to 250, and that's not very much at all, so that's not good either. This is the only part of the game that isn't technically superb, and it's worth noting that it runs well on older PCs as well. But seeing as the game's been out for nearly a month now and we're already up to patch 1.03, I think there's a good chance that will be fixed. Expect a good 15 minutes before you can find a game online that actually has the settings you want. And that's quite a long time to wait, isn't it, Jung? Especially when matches are so long. Right on the money. I mean, Dawn of War started this trend of faster, more intense RTS games. And I think that's a good trend, Badge. I think that's where RTS should be heading. Sins is on completely the other end of the spectrum, with matches taking hours to complete. This was OK in turn-based, because you could just take your turn and walk away from the computer. But here, with such a large time investment, the ratio of effort to reward comes into question. Is it worth spending hours building up your empire efficiency when you get a much smaller time in combat? Of course, you're not without battle the whole time. Space pirates will periodically attack whoever has the most bounty on their heads, and you can put up money to put a bounty on someone else. Trouble is, pirates are so powerful, they usually decide the outcome in the smaller matches. It's way too hard to take out a pirate base and the other player at the same time, so when the pirates are about to attack, it turns into a massive bidding war just to avoid them. Well, I agree. I mean, the space pirates have way too much sway over who wins the smaller games, but I can't believe that's coming from you, Badge. I mean, you dream about space pirates. Well, that's true, I have Space Pirates underpants, but I wasn't surprised that I went online and saw several games with the Pirates function turned off. 
Larger games allow you to use the pirates as a tool, where you can even raise the bounty on your own allies without them knowing. Indeed. Now, as this game has been out for a couple of weeks, we thought we'd resurrect a traditional good game tradition and find out what the forum goers have to say. Death Cheese from the forum says, I've played multiplayer a few times and found it boring, and I'm not an ADD-afflicted console gamer. I love Total War, Heroes of Might and Magic, Homeworld, and many others. For that most part, slower-paced games. But he found this lacking. Interesting that he mentions Homeworld, because a lot of the team that worked on this actually made Homeworld. Well, what are your final thoughts? Sense of a Solar Empire does a good job of bringing those turn-based ideas into real time, and, and because of that you get a high-quality, slow-paced RTS, but those three-hour stints of having to play it with that much concentration at a time in a chunk, it's not going to appeal to everybody. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. The most fun I had with this game was just setting up massive ship battles 50 on 50 and messing with the camera. They've made it fully moddable and there is a map designer. In fact, apparently there's a Star Wars mod on the way, so that'll be interesting. If you like this type of relaxed gameplay, then you know who you are. And if not, try the demo. I'm giving it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. Sins is a PC game and you can't actually buy it in a shop, but you can get it online. So, gamers, did you guess the game for this week? It was Hattress, developed by Alexei Pajitnov in 1992, who also invented Tetris. It played a lot like Tetris, but instead of shapes, different hats fell from the top of the screen. Stack five and they cleared for a cash bonus. Clear 15 stacks and you moved on to the next level. As you progressed through the game, you got help from a pair of bearded Russian midgets called Alexei and Vladimir. That's all we have time for this week. Next time, we'll be looking at the best free games on offer. We'd love to hear your suggestions, so jump on the forums. Let's be looking at the controversial subject of violence in video games. Is there a link between virtual and real-life crime? And we meet Peter Molyneux. He's responsible for games like Populous, Black and White and Fable, and considered to be a visionary in the gaming industry. When I sat down and created, you know, Populous, which was the start of this god game genre, I had no idea what I was creating. I certainly wouldn't have called it a genre. I could barely call it a game. And if you've been wondering what the strange pitches are in our credits from time to time over the last few months, they're part of our forum competition. If you'd like to be a part of our forum competition, jump on the forums and compete. Until next week, gamers, Bajo out. Jungles out.